<clears throat> okay, so we're gonna look at, again, the new book. I'm gonna share the screen. Shemot in a nutshell, the ex um, this is the parsha. here we go. Shemot, Shemot literally means names. So we begin to explain the children of Israel multiply in Egypt. Threatened by their growing numbers, Pharaoh enslaved them and orders the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, to kill all male babies at birth. When they do not comply, he commands his people to cast the Hebrew babies into the Nile. Um, a child is born to Yocheve, the daughter of Levi, and her husband, Amram, and placed in a basket on a river. In other words, the baby was born. They hid the baby for a few months because the baby was born early, according to the commentators. They, they, they explained the baby was born early so they could hide this, this child. But once, <clears throat> once the baby gets too old, they have to abandon him so the Egyptians don't throw, him in, don't throw the baby in the Nile. So they place the baby in a basket on the river. While the baby's sister Miriam stands watch from afar, Pharaoh's daughter discovers the boy raises him as her son and names him Moses. Uh, this doesn't convey the full, the full drama, um, how Moses' sister, Moses' sister Miriam orchestrates that Pharaoh's daughter should give the child to a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby. And she brings him, she brings Moshe's mother. So Moshe's mother raises her own child until he gets old enough and he goes back to the daughter of Pharaoh. As a young man, Moses leaves the palace and discovers the hardship of his brethren. He sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew and he kills the Egyptian. The next day he sees two Jews fighting. When he admonishes them, they reveal his deed of the previous day. And Moses is, is forced to flee to Midian because the Pharaoh wants to kill him for killing the Egyptian. There he rescues Jethro's daughters, marries one of them, Zipporah, and becomes a shepherd of his father-in-law's flock. And he thinks he's gonna have a very um, uneventful career uh, grazing the sheep. However, God appears to Moses in a burning bush at the foot of Mount Sinai and instructs him to go to Pharaoh and, and demand, let my people go so they may serve me, so they may serve me. Moses' brother Aaron is appointed to serve as a spokesman in Egypt, Moses and Aaron assemble the elders of, the, of Israel to tell them that the time of their redemption has come. The people believe, but Pharaoh refuses to let them go and even intensifies the suffering of Israel. And Moses returns to God in protest. Why have you done evil to this people? Why have you sent me? That's what he asks. It's a very powerful question. God promises that the redemption is close at hand. So that's the conclusion of the nutshell. It begins with the birth of, with the Jewish people uh, multiplying in the land of Egypt and develops into the slavery. And finally, the birth of Moses and God's calling to Moses to go back to Pharaoh and begin the, to and initiate the process of redemption. So that's, that's, this, that's in a nutshell. So there's a lot to talk about. We spoke about some things, of course, we, we speak about some things every year. But hopefully this year we'll add a few points and maybe review some of the points of last year. But every year we have to talk about, go ahead. Oh. Every year we have to talk about the name because the name, even before you start thinking about the details, what's the, what's the message of the word of the name of the book? So every book has a name that sort of gives sort of clarity about what the book is gonna talk about. So for example, Bereshit, Genesis, talks about the beginning of the history. Okay, so that's a good name, Genesis, what a beautiful name. Then you have Leviticus is the laws of the, the laws pertaining to the temple. So that's the tribe of Levi. And then we call it Bamidbar, the fourth book we call um, the desert. It's interesting in English, they call it numbers, but we call it the desert because it's the story of the Jewish people count, traveling through the desert. And finally, the fifth book, which is the Sermon of Moses, we call it Devarim, which is words. Wonderful. Each name, we understand why the name has the book, why the book has that specific name. But when it comes to the second book, um, we call Exodus is the English name or Greek name, um, which is a wonderful name because it really describes the, 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 the theme of the book in some sense. And it's actually, it actually grabs your attention. But what we refer to the book, the traditional way of referring to the book is the book of Shemot. 
Shemot means names, because that's the opening phrase of the book. These are the names of the children of Israel who descended to Egypt. So names, names is a very strange name. <laughs> names is a very strange name for a book because it doesn't really describe anything that's gonna happen in the book. And it also really could have been the name of the fourth book. So it doesn't really tell you much. So I think Exodus, if you ask me, I think Exodus is a better name. So that begs the question, why do we refer, why do we refer to it as the book of Sefer Shemot, the book of names? So there's at least two interpretations we can offer. Um, one we said in the past and one was new, and not new. I mean, no, one is new, I think, for this, for this meeting. In biblical Hebrew, shame is your name, but shame is also purpose. My name is my purpose. Like in biblical Hebrew, you can ask somebody, why are you here? Would be l'shem ma, like for the name what? Like for what name are you here? Right, in the Kabbalah, sometimes we say it in our prayer books, the Svardim say it a lot, we say it once a day, l'shem yichud, for the sake of the unity literally for the name of the unity. So the word shame, the word name is, the, is it's a name, but what is a name? A name is a, is a, is a, is a, a, a name is a definition. And a definition is defines what am I? What am I here? What's my purpose? So in some sense, this book gives us the name of the Jewish people. It gives us the purpose of the Jewish people because this book is the book where we get the Torah. This book is the book that we build the home to God in this world, the tabernacle, the Mishkan. And even the story of the Exodus is really a preparation for the giving of the Torah. So if you want to say, why do we refer to the second book as the book of names? Because the book of the names is because in the second book is where we get the concept of our name, our mission, our purpose. So that is one interpretation. Now, another interpretation that we said in the past, this is also, I believe, this is a teaching of the Rebbe. And that is like this. What happens is that we're going to shift in this book when we, we shift focus. In other words, the, the, the big shift of this book is that in Genesis, we're talking about, even when we talk about the patriarchs and matriarchs and their children and all the drama, but at the end of the day, we're talking about a family. And we're talking about how the family gets along or doesn't get along or should get along, but it's about a family. When you get to the book of Exodus, we're no longer a family, we're a people, we're a nation. It's actually interesting that the first person who classifies the Jewish people as a nation is Pharaoh. Because he says, oh, they're getting too big, they're becoming a nation, so they're a threat to our nationality, right? So I think, so it's interest, interesting to point out who labels us as a nation, but the bottom line is we multiply, we, we, we can't, you can't, you can't classify us any longer as sort of just the one nuclear, a, a, a small little family, even a large family, but one family. We're now becoming a nation, we're, coming, we're becoming a nation. Now, when you become a nation, the danger of becoming a nation, in other words, Asia, the, the issue of becoming a nation, the challenge of becoming a nation, especially a nation with a spiritual, mission and the spiritual purpose is that the individual could be lost. And sometimes for the sake of nationalism, we actually sacrifice individuals, right? So whatever you believe in, now whatever the goal of the, of the collective is, um, history is full of stories and full of, full of uh, examples where we sacrifice many individuals on the altar of the national need and the national goal, however it's defined. Now, the Torah, from God's perspective, even though we're a nation, what is a nation? A nation doesn't mean that the individual is not critical. To the contrary, a nation is strong because it's a collection of individuals. And therefore, the book where we transition from family to nation emphasizes the individual. And how does it do so? First of all, the name, right? There's name and there's a number. And when you talk about a number, a number means that the individual is not, not important. You say, well, it's 300 million people in America. Okay, fine. So what does that tell you? We are focusing on what the common denominator is between all the people. Each person is a number. Each person is one. And collectively, you get the collective number. But if you're going to begin by saying, okay, I have, a, have a, I have a whole nation here. But let me tell you the names of the individuals that came down to Egypt. So even though we're not going to list all 70 because it's not 70, we don't have enough space on the, on the parchment but we list the first 12, 
But again, the focus is names. When, when you say name, a name is unique to the person. And name highlights the unique qualities of every individual. And therefore, what this book is telling you at the outset, don't make a mistake. Just because we become a nation, it doesn't mean the individual is less important. And therefore, if you look through all the major stories of the book, you will see that the Torah goes out of its way to highlight this point, the purpose and the importance of the individual. Um, if you want an example, so this week's parasha, Moses, we, 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 we does, we, where does he start his career? He doesn't start his career because he realizes that there are hundreds of thousands of Jews enslaved. It's not where he starts his career. It's not what inspires him. What inspires his involvement with his brethren is that there's one Jew being um, um, hit, hit by an Egyptian. He sees the pain of an individual. That's what inspires him to act. Not collective, not the policies, not the social policies that the Egyptians implemented against the Jews. That's not what, that's not what moved him. What moved him is the individual person's pain. And then there's also the, so the next major story, in other words, that, that's the Exodus. And then you talk about the center of the book is the preparation and the giving of the Torah. So it's well known the teachings of the sages that when God gives us the Torah, he speaks the Ten Commandments in the Ten Commandments are written in the singular. I am the Lord, your God. But in Hebrew, there's your in the singular and your in the plural. In English, it's the same, it's neutral. Um, but the, right, you could say, Anochi Hashem Elokechem, I'm the Lord, your God in the plural. But no, the Ten Commandments says, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I'm the Lord, your God in the singular. Because the Torah is emphasizing that every single individual is, God has a relationship with every individual, even though we're part of a people. And the same thing is when you go to the next big theme of the book, which is the theme of building of the tabernacle, the home to God. Again, the Torah says, make for me a tabernacle, but I will dwell in them, not in it. And the sages say, where does God want to dwell? God doesn't want to dwell in the tabernacle, which is the collective home that the collective Jewish people made. That too. But that's a symbol to what's really happening. What's really happening is that God is dwelling in them, in the plural, in the, in the heart of every individual. So if you look through the entire book, you see that in all major stories, the emphasis is on the individual. And the broader idea here is when we move from family to nation, we have to emphasize and remember that that doesn't mean that the individual is not significant to the contrary. Then we have to work even harder to convey to every individual that to them, that to God, every individual is, is as powerful as the full nation. So that is, um, that is the first point. Just we didn't even open up the book, right? But just this is just a pre, this is just an introduction just by thinking about the name of the book even before we go any further. So that is point number one. Now we have to open the book. And now what we want to do is you want to open the book and we want to challenge, of course, is to speak about something new that we haven't spoken about in the last, what is it, 15 years? Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully we'll give some new points, but some points I'm going to have to repeat because they're so sweet and they're so, and they're so um, important and so fundamental and so inspiring that we can't, not, we can't not repeat it. But you also have to get some new stuff. Otherwise you say, oh, I heard this already. So um, we'll do a little bit of both, God willing. So we open the book, the current Parsha, Parsha text. Here we go. Okay, so we read, we read the Jewish people come, the Jewish people, um, we can't set the names of the Jewish people coming to Egypt. He's a new king. We discussed yesterday if he's a new king, is he not a new king? And basically, and basically they enslave the Jews and then there's a decree. What's the decree? The decree is to throw the, the male children into the Nile. So I'm gonna read a little bit about the, about, about the midwives who are supposed to carry out this decree. I'm also a little biased because the names of the midwives are Shifra and Pua. According to the Medrash, Shifra is really Yocheved, Moses' mother, and Pua is really Miriam, Moses' sister. We read about later in the Parsha. And of course, Miriam is our new daughter, baby, baby Miriam, who's named after my grandmother, who's having her second yard site uh, next week, two weeks. So we'll talk a little bit about the Miriams. Okay, so let's read a few verses. Now the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one whose name was Shifra, and the second who, named, who, who, who was named Pua. 
Why Shifra and Pua? Rashi says, let's open Rashi, why not? Okay, so the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one who was named was Shifra, and the second one was named was Pua. Says Rashi, skipping to the second Rashi, Shifra, this was Yocheved, Moses' mother, called Shifra because she beautified Mishaperet, the newborn infants. That comes from the Talmud track, it's Sota. So the name Shifra comes from the word Shapir, beautiful. Pua, this was Miriam, Yocheved's daughter, Moses' sister called Pua because she cried Poa and talked and cooed to the newborn infants in the manner of women who soothe a crying infant. Pua is an expression of crying out, similar, similar to like a traveling woman will cry F.E. Rashi on Sota explains that she played with the infant to soothe and amuse him. Okay, fine. So we have Shifra and Pua, and the reason why we name them Shifra and Pua is because we of what they did. That's that. That's the. That's not so much the name of the individual, but it's the name of their job. One was beautified, one would clean the child, and one would soothe the child. So just a, a, a parenthetic idea here. Um, according to the sages, seem to be saying whenever this, whenever there's a name of the Bible that appears only once and does not appear again, and we don't know anything about that name, Shifra and Pua. Search through the entire Bible. There's no Shifra. There's no Pua. Who were they? Where do they come from? Where do they go into? So the sages always believe that the Torah is not just throwing in names. If the Torah mentions names that are not mentioned anywhere else, it's because they're really names of people who we already know. It's another name for these people. And there are many other examples for this, especially in the later books of the, of the Bible. So that's just the par parenthetically. So we have Shifra and Pua, but the bottom line is Yochev and Miriam or not. The bottom line is these are two, are the, two of the Hebrew midwives. What does the Pharaoh tell them? And he said, when you deliver the Hebrew woman and you see on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall put him to death. But if it is a daughter, she may live. Okay, so we're killing the male, the male um, sons. Why the male sons? Let's, why, why only the boys, not the girls? Says Rashi, if it is a son, Pharaoh cared only about the males because his astrologers told him that his son was destined to be born who would save them. So either he believed in astrology or you could just say simply, he didn't, he didn't feel like a woman is going to lead the Jewish people out of Egypt. He wasn't afraid of a woman, but he's afraid of the men. Okay, fine. Now, the midwives, however, feared God. So they did not do as the king of Egypt had spoken to them, but they enabled the boys to live. So they defied Pharaoh, which is dangerous business, but that's what they did. So now let's read the second reading. They defied the Pharaoh. Um, show Rashi's commentary. Now, Rashi, now, now Pharaoh sees, show Rashi's commentary. Yeah. Now, Rashi sees, now Pharaoh sees that his, his decree is being defied. The birth rate is not going down. The males are being kept alive. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing that you have enabled the boys to live? And the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are skilled as, as midwives. When the midwife has, has not yet come to them, they have already given birth. They say, look, we're, they, they, they don't need us. We, by the time we come, it's already late to the game. We can't kill the child. We're late to the game. Okay. God benefited the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. Okay, one more verse. Now it took place. When the midwives feared God, that he made houses for them, or homes for them. That is the reward that the midwives get for defying Pharaoh and fearing God and, and, and defying Pharaoh. What's the reward? The reward is God, he, meaning God, made houses for them. What does it mean? It means they started investing in real estate and they got a lot of uh, buildings in downtown Manhattan. No, so Rashi says, that he made houses for them, says, says Rashi, house is like a dynasty. The houses of priesthood, the, Levi, the, 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 the Levitic, Levitic family, and the royal family, which are called houses, as it is written, and he built the house of the Lord and the house of the king. The priesthood and the Levitic family from Yocheved, and the royal family from Miriam, as it is stated in Tractate Sotah. 
So what is um, what is Rashi saying? Quoting the Medra, quoting the Talmud, Rashi is saying that God made for these women, He made them homes, homes as in dynasties. What dynasty? The priesthood and the Levite family, which come from Yocheved, and the kingship comes from Miriam, even though the kings are from the tribe of Judah, and Miriam was not from the tribe of Judah, but Miriam married, um, Miriam married, Miriam married um, someone from the tribe of Judah. I want to say that Miriam married Kalev, one of the 12 spies. Um, yeah, Miriam married Kalev, one of the 12 spies, according to the rabbinic tradition. But in any case, so that's what you get. They, they did not fear, they, they don't fear God. They don't fear Pharaoh. They fear God. They save the children. And God makes for them homes. What does homes mean? Dynasties. That is the conventional interpretation with the Medrash. Now we get to a Hasidic interpretation. So the Hasidic interpretation says as follows, it's not Chabad, but it's Hasidic. So this is based on the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. The teaching of the Baal Shem Tov says, the Baal Shem Tov says that every person, by the way, the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, the, 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 the legend about the Baal Shem Tov is that, again, I say a legend because we're not 100%, you know, there's not that much uh, um, historic, historic, uh, um, um, evidence for every, for, for, for every detail of his life. So a lot of this is just tradition, but this is the story. The story that is told about the Baal Shem Tov is that he was orphaned from a very young age, orphaned from his parents, maybe at age five, maybe as young as five. And he was orphaned and he would spend a lot of time in the woods around the town. And because later on also within the, within the mystical movement of Judaism, the Hasidim and also the people the, the, what preceded Hasidism, they felt that they, would, they felt closer to God within nature. So they would spend a lot of time in nature. And the Baal Shantav, as a young child is roaming the woods. And either he said it as a child or he said it later, he said he was not afraid of any of the animals. He wasn't afraid. Why wasn't he afraid? So he said, that before my father passed away, he called me to his bedside and he told me, only fear God and don't, feel, don't, don't fear anything other than God. He says, from then I never fear anything, I only fear God. That's the story. Why am I saying the story? I'm saying the story because the Baal Shem Tov has a teaching and the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov goes as follows. He says, everybody has a fear. Fear is a tremendous motivator of people. People are motivated by fear. We don't like to think that. We like to think that we're only motivated by doing what we want. But the reality is that People are motivated by fear. The reason why um, I pay the electric bill is because I'm, I'm afraid that the electric company is going to shut down the electricity, right? So there, there you go. But you have it. And you can find many examples in the day where we're motivated by fear. The Baal Shanto says, naturally, a person is afraid. A person is small. A person understands there are forces beyond themselves. And the nature of the psyche of the human being is to be afraid of that which is transcends or the unknown. And, and, that, and, that's, and that's, that's the way people are. You can't, you can't get away from that. However, says the Baal Shem Tov, who is fearless? Who is fearless? If your fear is a fear of God, then you don't fear anybody else or anything else. So the fear of God actually will nullify all other fears. So here you have the two women, the midwives, standing up to Pharaoh. They say, no, we're not, they don't, they don't listen to Pharaoh's decree. Now the question becomes, how do, they, how do they have the courage not to, listen to not listen to Pharaoh? So the verse doesn't say. The verse just says they don't listen to the Pharaoh. And we have to assume that probably they're very moral, et cetera. Fill in the blank by yourself. But the Baal Shanto says, no, maybe the verse does say how they um, were able to have the courage to defy Pharaoh. Not just defy Pharaoh, but not fear Pharaoh. Why? Because the verse says twice, they feared God. And if you fear God, it nullifies all other, all other fears, right? It says it twice. It says, if you look at, if you look at um, the first time around in the actual story, right? So all the way at the bottom, the actual story, it says, um, the midwives, however, feared God. So they did not do as the king of Egypt has spoken to them, right? So the Torah tells you why, why, they, why they defied Pharaoh. But I'm adding how they defied Pharaoh. 
How were they unfair of Pharaoh? How, how, did they, how were they unafraid of Pharaoh? Because they feared God. And then on the next reading, when it says that they were in their reward, the verse once again reiterates that point. Verse 21. Now what took place when the midwives feared God, that he made houses for them. How do they defy Pharaoh? How were they not afraid of Pharaoh? Because they were fear, afraid of God. So what really happens here, what the Bashantov is telling you, fear of God is liberating. Why is it liberating? Because it's liberating of all the other unfounded fears. Person is a fear, a fear of God, and that's the only legitimate fear, because God ultimately is the all-powerful, that actually releases you from all the fears of the things that really you should not be afraid of. Because ultimately, you understand that whatever God does is for the good, and there's a purpose to your life, and that releases you of all the other fears. So Beth is not here, but I think we, 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 I think we they have to give this to the psychologist, to, to psychologists to digest and explain and, 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 and really think about this. But I think this is a profound point. If I have the fear of God, it's actually liberating. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't mean I'm running around fearful the whole day. To the contrary, it means it actually liberates me of everything else because nobody can harm me because God is on my side. Now, of course, I fear God. God is, God is, God is ultimately uh, transcendent and ultimately I'm in awe of God. So yeah, God is the only justifiable fear, but that releases us from all other fears. And here we get to the point of the Hasidic interpretation. Says the Hasidic interpretation, you look at the reward. What was the reward? The reward is he made houses for them. Now house, what, what does houses mean? So I told you house means um, houses of priesthood and kingship, wonderful. So why doesn't the Torah say that? Torah should say he made them priests. He made them, their descendants. He made, gave them dynasties. Why homes? You'd say homes and a home is what allows for, and the home could be interpreted in Rashi based on the Talmud to mean, to mean dynasties. So it's just to keep the Talmud in business, to have, give the Talmud what to talk about. That's why the Torah says homes, and we interpret homes mean dynasties. Like, why can't you just say dynasties? So the answer, the Hasidic answer is because there's a message in the home. In addition to dynasties, home itself is a message. What is a home? A home is a place where you come for peace and serenity. When you're outside in the world, you're, 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 you're affected by the elements. When you come home, you have, hopefully, when you come home, you have shelter, you have peace of mind, you have comfort. And that's what, and that's what the verse is telling you. The verse is telling you because these midwives feared God, that's why they get the reward. What's the reward? He made houses for them. They have peace, they have serenity, they're not, they're not afraid of the dictator. That's the reward. And that's not a reward, that's a result of fearing God, because fearing God gives you that peace and serenity because it releases you of all other fears and all other uh, worries. So that is the Hasidic interpretation. Of course, it's not instead of the rabbinic interpretation that they get dynasties. It's, it's not instead, it's in addition, because otherwise it should say dynasties, but it doesn't say dynasties. It says home. What does home evoke? What image does home evoke? You come home, you're, you have peace, you have serenity, you're comfortable, and that's, and that's, and that's what they get. So that's sort of the fear of God is what allows them to have the inner serenity and, and, and the inner courage not to fear Pharaoh. So in the end result, if you want to liberate yourself from fear, there's only one path. And what is that? To fear God. But you can't, you can't, there's nobody that has no fear at all. Impossible. You can't do that. So if you want to negate the unfounded fear, you have to introduce the true fear. That is the Hasidic interpretation. And that I think we have not said before. So that's, that's for that. Um, before we get to other points. Okay, one more new point we have to say. Let me go back to the we go back to the to the to the points that we say every year. Okay, so I want to go further in the story to the point. By the way, if anyone has any comments or questions or any specific part of the story that you want to talk about, um, please share. So we can address that as well. So we're going to skip a little bit to the end, toward the end, not the end, but toward the end. And this is where the conversation between Moses and Pharaoh, I'm sorry, Moses and God. And we know that God wants Moses to take the, to go back to Egypt and encourage and, and get the Pharaoh to speak to Pharaoh, to release the Jews. Moses doesn't want the job. And there's back and forth. And there's so many, there's so many, um, it's a back and forth because Moses is reluctant. According to the sages, according to the sages, actually it took God seven days to convince Moshe to take the job. 
So alluded to in the verses, he says today, yesterday, the day before, but he says it in the plural. So it's six days. In any case, six days means on the seventh day, he met Moshe relents and goes back. So we have this back and forth and Moshe says all kinds of things. For example, verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should take the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God gives him a whole, a whole, a whole answer to that. Then verse 13, and Moses said to God, behold, I come to the children of Israel. And I said to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to, to you, has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I, what shall I say to them? How can, I, how can I take them out of Egypt? I don't even know your name. I don't know, have any information about you. So verse 14 answers. So Hashem tells him, okay, I'll tell you my name. And it goes on and on and on. And Moshe says, this whole speech, Moshe says, no. Moses answered and said, behold, they will not believe me and they will not lead, heed my voice. But they will say, the Lord has not appeared to me. God says, okay, I'll make you miracles. I'll give you miracles to make for miracles. So they may, he makes a few magic tricks. Um, he, he, Moshe doesn't let go. Moshe, verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, I beseech you, O Lord, I am not a man of words, neither from yesterday nor from the day before yesterday, nor from the time you have spoken to your servants, for I am heavy of mouth and heavy of tongue. I can't speak, I stutter. I'm not a man of speaking, not from today, not from yesterday, not from two days ago. And I'm not a man of speech. So God answers that. God says, oh, don't worry. I, I, I help people speak. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't go. It doesn't stop. Finally, Moses' final um, concern is, but he said, verse 13, but he said, I beseech you, O Lord, send now your message with whom you would send. Moses says, please, what are you sending me? Send with whom you would send. We'll see what that means in a minute. At this point, God is already angry, and the Lord's wrath was kindled against Moses, and he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he will surely speak, and behold, he is coming forth toward you, and when he sees you, he will rejoice in his heart. You shall speak to him, and you shall put the words into his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will instruct you both what you shall do. And he will speak to you for, for you to the people, and it will be that he will be, be, be your speaker, and you will be his leader and you shall take the staff in your hand with which you shall perform the signs. That's what does it. Moshe has a concern, verse 13. Moshe raises an objection. He says, send with whom you would send. And God says, he's upset. Well, oh, you have Aaron, you have Aaron. How does that help anything? So let Aaron go, why do I have to go? So we really have to figure out what exactly was Moshe's final concern and how God alleviates this concern and the reason why it's relevant is not just to know about the history, but to know because, again, we're going to apply this all to the, to the human soul as well, to every person's life. Because as we know, the famous Hasidic teaching that everybody has in Egypt, Egypt means constraints and limitations. That's what the Hebrew word Mitzrayim means. And each of us have to experience the exodus in our own life. And part of the exodus is unleashing our inner Moses. And... And how to, how to unleash the inner roses, there are certain obstacles Moshe doesn't want to go, and we have to figure out how God gets Moshe to go. But whatever God did worked. How do I know it worked? Because you turn the page, and Exodus chapter 4, verse 18, Moses went and returned to Yeter, his father-in-law, etc. Verse 20, so Moses took his wife and his sons, mounted them on top of the donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took his staff of God in his hand. So if you were wondering, I know you had this question before you got onto this call. You were wondering, how did Moshe get out to Egypt? Did he take the train? Did he take his car? Was it a hybrid? Was it a Jeep? What did he do? So the answer is, God is telling you, and it's very good to know, God tells you that he took, the, he took them, mounted them upon the donkey. In case you were worried, so it wasn't a camel, it was a donkey. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because it's strange. Why does the Torah tell us how Moshe goes to Egypt? What do I care that he put them on the donkey? Right? The Torah is very careful not to give us information that's uh, not necessary. And when Jacob went down to Egypt, in other words, there are many times in the Torah that we don't know how he traveled. Why does, why does here the Torah says Moshe traveled on the donkey? There's also another interesting subtlety, and that is, it says the donkey, not a donkey. Right? It says he mounted them upon a donkey. He found the donkey, put them on the donkey, and they went home. And they went to Egypt. But it says, no, it says the donkey. What's the donkey? The donkey, the hey, the the, means that it's a famous donkey. So let's look at the Medrash. Now, the Medrash is going to sound very strange, 
but we're going to, I'm going to read the Medrash. I think Rashi quotes the Medrash. And we'll really try to figure out what the Medrash is really trying to tell us here. So, oh, says Rashi, mounted them upon the donkey. The donkey means the designated donkey, the famous donkey. That is the donkey that Abraham saddled for, bind, for the binding of Isaac. And that is the one upon, upon whom the King Messiah is destined to appear. As it is said, humble and riding a donkey, Prophet Zechariah. Oh, so Rashi says, uh, quotes the Medrash, Rashi says, Moshe took the donkey. Which donkey? Not just any donkey that he found in the market. He took the donkey. Which donkey? Remember the donkey? A few hundred years earlier, there was a donkey that Abraham took to the binding of Isaac. It says that Abraham took um, the wood, the firewood, and, the, and, and fire, and the stone, and he put it on the knife, and he put it on the donkey, and he went to the place that God had told him. That's the binding of Isaac. So that donkey is actually still on the scene. And when Moshe has to go to Egypt, he takes that donkey down with him to Egypt. By the way, that's not the only uh, thing on that donkey's resume, that he actually was the donkey that Abraham, hundreds of years earlier, Abraham took to Egypt. There's also something else on the resume. What's else? This donkey is going to be the donkey upon which the Mashiach will come and to, to, to ultimately initiate the Messianic, the Messianic era. Um, that's the same donkey. How do I know? Because Zechariah says he's an, a Mashiach will be a, poor, a humble, literally ani, a, a pauper, or a humble, and riding a donkey. So this is a very famous donkey, and it's good to know that this donkey has a history. He's been part of the, he has been, he's been the donkey that, that, that Abraham took to the binding of Isaac. He's also going to be the donkey going to Mashiach. The question becomes is, this is very unusual for Rashi. This medrash is non-literal, right? The donkey is, is, not, is a few hundred years old now. And by the time Mashiach comes, the donkey will be a few thousand years old, right? So there's a medrash, so it's not literal. Rashi usually doesn't quote medrash in like this. So what exactly is happening here and how do we make sense of it? So I'll give you a nice interpretation from the Rebbe. And that ties into Moshe's final complaint. Moshe, Moshe, Moshe has a complaint and, and he says, don't send with me, send it with somebody else. God never answered. But the donkey may be the answer to Moshe's concern. Well, let's see what we mean and then let's see how we apply it to ourselves. Um, so Rashi's commentary. But he said, this is again, the Moshe's final protest, Moshe's final uh, uh, card to say, God, it's not me. I can't, I'm not good for the job. He tries all, he says, who am I? I'm humble, I can't speak, I can't talk, I, I stutter. He tries everything, doesn't really work. Finally, Moshe says, I beseech you, O Lord, verse 13, I beseech you, O Lord, send now your message with whom you would send. What does that even mean? Says Rashi, with whom you would send with whom you are accustomed to sending. And this is Aaron. In other words, he says, why are you taking me? You have other people on your payroll. Aaron, Moshe, was a, ran away from Egypt for many decades. Moshe is in Midian, in southern, uh, southern Jordan. Aaron is Moshe's older brother. And Moshe's older brother was the son of Amram, who was considered from the tribe of Levi. So they were considered the leader of the Jewish people. So God tells Moshe, go find somebody else. Go find the person who you, you are accustomed to send. Go find somebody who is already in the business of leadership. Go find my, old, my older brother. That's the first interpretation. When Moshe says, send now with whom you would send, meaning with whom you usually send, the, 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 with whom the, the person who is already the leader of the Jewish people, and that is Aaron. Why would I come, the younger brother, and unseat my, my older brother, Aaron, and become the leader. You already have a leader who's already on your payroll. Go to Aaron, what do you want from me? That's the first interpretation of the Medrash. Then there's another one, Davar Acher, another explanation. With someone else with whom you wish to send. For I am not destined to bring them into the land of Israel and to be their redeemer in the future. You have many messengers. The second Medrash is actually very interesting. Moshe senses, I don't know how, either by prophecy or because he senses from the conversation with God, he senses that even though he's going to be the one to lead them out of Egypt, he senses he is not going to be the one to bring them into the land of Israel. 
And certainly not, he's not going to be the, 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 the future, the, the, the ultimate redeemer, the Mashiach. So in other words, Moshe is saying, anyway, you need somebody else in the future to redeem them. Either Joshua, who will bring them into the land of Israel, or ultimately Mashiach, who will bring the world to perfection and bring the ultimate redemption. So Moshe says, what do you want from me? Go straight to them. Go find the person who's going to bring the ultimate redemption. Why would you come to me where I'm only initiating the process? So that's the second interpretation. So Moshe doesn't want to go. Why doesn't he want to go? First of all, he says, go find the person who's, who, who you're used to taking. Go find Aaron. Aaron is in the position of leadership. He knows how to lead. That na comes natural to him. Go to Aaron. That's one interpretation. What's the second interpretation? Second interpretation is go to the person who's going to bring about the final redemption. That's Moshe's complaint, right? Don't get me. I could start the job, but I can't finish the job. Do you know what? Go to the guy who's going to finish the job. Now, we don't really see Moshe, God's answer to Moshe. We see that God says, oh, you mentioned Aaron? Yeah, Aaron will help you. He'll be your assistant. How does that help? I told you to go to Aaron. You told me Aaron's going to work for me? No, I'll help Aaron. Why, why do I have to go before Aaron? So God doesn't really answer. And certainly God doesn't say anything about the future redemption. Until you turn the page and you encounter the donkey and you encounter the medrash on the donkey that we just read. So let's see what happens here. What does the medrash tell you about the donkey? Moshe sees the donkey. And this donkey reminds us of two donkeys that appear earlier in scripture, one that appears earlier in scripture and one that's gonna appear later. But Moshe, what does Moshe know about a donkey? Moshe knows that a donkey is what Abraham took to the binding of Isaac, meaning to say, a donkey represents the binding of Isaac. What's the binding of Isaac? The binding of Isaac is the ultimate devotion that Abraham um, um, expressed, devotion of God that he's willing to sacrifice his own son. So what does God, what does Moses say? Don't send me, it's uncomfortable. Send my older brother. It's not, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I am not, I'm not used to this job. What does the donkey remind him? You have to learn from Abraham. Abraham was devoted to the extent that he was willing to sacrifice his son. You certainly could devote yourself and go beyond your comfort zone. Point number one. Point number two, Mo Moshe says, <clears throat> I am not going to bring the final redemption. So why send me? Send the person who's going to bring the final redemption. What's the answer? The answer is very interesting. The same donkey that Moshe takes to Egypt reminds us of the donkey of Moshiach. What does that mean? That means that it's one continuum. It's both the same theme. You cannot get to the ultimate redemption if you don't start with Moses. Moses starts the redemption, and even though it's not complete, but you have to start, and the beginning of the redemption is what will allow the ultimate redemption later. So you can't say, find the ultimate redemption. The ultimate redemption will not work unless Moses goes to Egypt. And that's why you put the donkey. The donkey reminds us of Abraham. God is telling him, signaling to him, remember Abraham's devotion? I'm not asking you to sacrifice your son. I'm asking you to do something much that requires even less a devotion that the, the, the sacrifice of going to Egypt pales a comparison to the a sacrifice of Abraham. And you have the other concern, send Mashiach. There's no Mashiach. Mashiach is the culmination of your donkey. If you're not going to start, Mashiach can't continue. That's the medrash. That's the teaching. Everything is beautiful. Now just now comes that now comes the home run. Now we got all the people on base. And now we have to do the grand slam. Now comes the grand slam. What's the grand slam? The grand slam is if you want to talk about it in our life, what's really happening here? What does this mean to us? So let's go for the grand slam. Let's try. Let's try not to strike out. What happens here is like this. We are in our own Egypt, right? That's the premise. The premise is that everything that's going to happen in this book is also not just the story of the past. It's also the story of the present and the story of each individual. Like we said, we're not talking only about a nation and a national story. We're talking about a name, individual story. So I have my own Egypt. What's my Egypt? My Egypt is what constrains me, what holds me back. Um, my limitations, my habits, my fears, etc. So that's my Egypt. Now I have to break free of Egypt. And to break free of Egypt, you need my Moses. But to do so, to break free, you really need to have these two ideas in mind. The biggest obstacle, if you don't have these two ideas that what the donkey represents, you're not going to be able to, to break free. What does the donkey represent? First of all, the donkey represents the devotion of Abraham. To break out of your inner Egypt takes a commitment. It's not going to happen by itself. You can't wait for something else for the circumstances to, to align. It requires devotion. You have a problem, you have to devote yourself to correcting the problem. It takes work, it takes effort, it takes devotion. 
That is represented by the donkey of Abraham. Abraham represents the devotion to go and to sacrifice oneself, but to devote oneself to the cause. Thank God that what was required of us is not the devotion required of Abraham, but the imagery, the imagery of Abraham being willing to devote himself to the project, that is what's required. You have to take it seriously. If you want to break free of your Egypt, you can't just say, okay, one day I'll do it. You really have to want it. You have to want it. You have to really want to do it and you really have to be devoted. Okay, that's number one. But point number two, the greater obstacle is why people stay trapped is because they fear that even if I try to change my ways, I'm not going to be able to. Even if I get a minor victory, eventually I'm going to fall back in my own ways. In other words, the redemption, the freedom that I'm going to get is only temporary and it's not everlasting. So why should I try? Okay, an example. I smoke, not that I smoke. An example. So what am I going to do? Today I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to be a cigarette free. Okay, but tomorrow I'm going to fall back. So what's the point of going to battle today if, even if I achieve the freedom, it's only going to be temporary. Right or any example today, I'm going to say I'm not going to be enslaved to my own to my own uh, um, to my own uh, um, temperament. And today I'm going to be patient. Today when my kids come home, I'm going to be as patient as can be. And it takes a lot of effort. But ultimately, I say, why would I invest this effort? I know tomorrow I'm going to revert back. This victory that I'm going to achieve today, this freedom that I'm going to achieve, going to achieve today, is only temporary. And that's a very big. Um, uh, that's a very big discouragement to anybody trying to break free because the task is so great that I say, I'm anyway not going to be completely free. I'm anyway not going to be able to liberate myself completely. So why start? Why try? And that's a tremendous obstacle to personal growth. You know, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to be kind. I'm going to try to do whatever I want, whatever, whatever personal growth is to me. And I say, but, but it's not going to be complete. It's only, temp it's only a temporary small victory. And that's what Moshe, and, and that's what Moshe is saying. Moshe is saying, you're sending me to take the Jews out of Egypt, but we're not, it's, not, it's not a real victory. We're not really achieving the goal. We're not getting into Israel. We're not going to bring the, the, the world to ultimate redemption. Eventually, we're, gonna, we're going to revert back. We're going to slip back into our bad ways and be exiled again. So what are you wasting your time with small victories? Go send the final redeemer who will be able to make ult an ultimate redemption, complete redemption. And what, is, what does God say? God says there's no such thing as a complete redemption. Complete redemption begins with a small liberation, with a small victory. And the first step to the ultimate redemption begins with a full step. And you won't get to the ultimate redemption unless you fight for a limited uh, uh, redemption. And that's what we're saying. It's one continuum. The small redemption will ultimately lead to the big redemption. And it's true in our own life. In our own life, when we have our idea of what enslaves us. So how do, we, how, do, how do we overcome it? How do we... Begin the process of liberation. First of all, Abraham, devotion. You have to be committed to it. It's not going to happen by itself. Number two, don't try to complete the task. Try to begin the task. There's a beautiful teaching in the Ethics of the Fathers that says like this. The task, I'm going to read. Yeah, hopefully it's in this book. Uh, it's not in this book. For we days. It says, <laughs> The task is not upon you to finish it. Nobody asks you to finish the task. Nevertheless, you are not free from, you're not free to ignore it. You don't have to finish it, but you have to start. It. And it's never going to finish unless you start. Mashiach can't come if Moshe doesn't initiate the process of liberation. And that's what you say, oh, that, that's, what, that's what you want me to do. That I can do. You have to be devoted to start the process. Fine. That's what Moshe learns. What is, what, what's the imagery? According to the Medrash, what's the imagery that gives this point to Moshe? The donkey. What does the donkey represent? When you hear donkey, what do you think about? You think about the donkey of Abraham. You think about the donkey of redemption. And Moshe's donkey is in the middle. Moshe learns from the dedication of Abraham and understands that his limited free, uh, um, liberation is the first step into the ultimate and complete liberation. And never try to achieve, it's, it's not a question of all or nothing. You start with one step, eventually that triggers, that, that opens up, that elicits more energy that ultimately will be able to bring the tipping point where a person will be completely free. But it has to start with something limited and something specific with a limited goal. So that I think is interesting. And that's, uh, that is um, the imagery of this animal, which explains why Rashi is running to talk about the donkey, the donkey of Mashiach. It's really out of Rashi's character to talk about a medrash, non-literal, the donkey is thousands of years old, because Rashi says, we need something. What did, what did, Mo, where did Moshe, how was Moshe's concern answered? Moshe has two concerns. He says, fine, it's not comfortable for me to do it. 
and go find Mashiach, go find the person who will bring a complete redemption. So we are the, in the verse, the verse has to allude to something that would actually change Moshe's mind and actually uh, give, him, give him clarity about what, what, what he's, why he's chosen. And that's why Rashi goes to the Medrash and says, it's the donkey. Because otherwise, why does the Torah mention the donkey? It's the donkey, it's what the donkey represents. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is a story in short. The second point that we have not said in the past, and now we have six minutes left to enjoy the good stuff that we say every year. In the meantime, comments, questions, jokes, uh, please jump in. But here we go. Okay, so one thing that we say every year, which is fa absolutely fascinating, is the Torah, remember I told you, it says Miriam, and it says, it says Yocheved. It says Shifra and Pua, it doesn't really say their names. So let's see where else this, this plays out. So let's look at the Parsha. And we go to the second reading where we talk about the birth of Moses. So this is Exodus chapter two, verse number one. A very interesting verse. A man of the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. There's a man, there's a woman. They are anonymous. We have no idea who they are. We just know their tribe, but it doesn't say their name and they got married. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw him that he was good, she hid him for three months. This is the story of the birth of, of Moshe, okay? Doesn't say his father's name, doesn't say his mother's name. Not because we don't know. How do we know Moshe, Moshe's mother and father? So we don't just know it because of the Medrash. We actually know it because the Torah itself, uh, in a little while, is going to give us the full lineage of Moshe and Aaron. So if you want to see where the Torah does it, next week's Parsha, the Torah gives us the full lineage of Moshe and Aaron. So we know exactly who Moshe's mother is and who Moshe's father is, which just begs the question, if we actually know who Moshe's father is, and uh, so why did... Why does the Torah not say it in Exodus chapter two? And why does the Torah wait until Exodus chapter six to tell us who Moshe and Aaron's mother is? Moshe's mother and father is, right? Look at verse 20. So this is, um, I skipped to Exodus chapter six, verse 20. Aaron, I'm sorry, Amram took Yocheved, his aunt and his, as, his, as his wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the years of Amram's life were 137 years. Okay, what do we know? We know clearly Exodus chapter 6, verse 20. We know who Moshe's mother is. We know who Moshe's father is. There's no mystery here. Yet, the first time the story of Moshe is introduced in Exodus chapter 2, what do we know about Moshe's parents? We know nothing. The Torah goes out of its way to keep the identity vague, even though the Torah has no choice but to say the identity in chapter 6. But in chapter 1, Chapter two, it's a man. A man from Levi went to that and found someone from the house, house of Levi. Tell me the mother is, tell me the father is. Why are we not telling you what the mother and father is? Answer, the answer is because then we think that the reason why Moshe had the courage to initiate the liberation is because of his lineage. There was something special about him. When the Torah wants to tell you the story and the Torah tells you, anybody can be a Moses. And that's why we're not gonna say he had an extraordinary father. We're not gonna say an extraordinary mother because then it's not, it's not a story for me. So we say anybody could do this. What were, this we say, this also we say every year, what were Moshe's credentials? What were Moshe's credentials? Why did God choose him? You get to the fourth reading, you see that God chooses Moshe, but God appears to Moshe at the burning bush, right? Verse chapter three, Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from within the thorn bush. That's chapter three. Why was Moshe chosen? Why Moshe? Why not anybody else? So was he good looking? Was he smart? Did he know the whole Talmud by heart? What, was he, was he, what do we know about it? We know nothing about it. So the only way, if you want to know what Moshe's credentials, you have to look at chapter three, at the third reading. What's the third reading? Exodus chapter two. Here we have the, this, the credentials of Moshe. The credentials of Moshe are three stories. That's the credentials of Moshe. Not that he was smart, not, even though he was smart. Not that he was spiritual, even though he was spiritual. He was good looking, all true. That's not why he was chosen. How do I know? Because that's not what the Torah says. Later on, if you stick around, if you don't fall off and you stick around to the book of Numbers, you will hear that Moshe is the humblest of men. 
And that's why he was the greatest prophet because prophecy is connected to humility. But that's not, that, that's not the essential point because if it was the essential point, we would say it in chapter two, the first time Moshe is introduced. We don't say that until way into, into, into the fourth book of the Torah. So what I'm reading here, why was Moshe introduced? All I know, why was Moshe chosen? All I know is these three stories. And what are these three stories? Do you know the stories? Let's read it again. But what are the three stories? The three stories are that Moshe sticks, stands up for the oppressed. Egyptian hitting a Jew, a Jew hitting a Jew, and ultimately, the, when he runs away to Midian, the male shepherds do not allow, uh, um, harass the female shepherd, the daughter of Jethro, and Moshe saves her, and then she goes home, er, she goes home and her father says, why are you home so early? Because usually they would not be able to water their sheep until after all the males, water, all, the, all the men water their sheep. So father's like, why are you home so early? So they said, this is the first, I'm not making this up. They said, well, there was an Egyptian man who saved us and helped us. So father says, what? You mean you didn't bring him home for dinner? And he brings him home for dinner and he ends up marrying Sephora. So that's the story. But the bottom line is there are three stories of, the oppre- the, of standing up for the oppressed. And that's what Moshe is. That's why he's chosen because that's really his career. That's the career of the, lead, of, of the, of the leader, not necessarily not to protect the rich and powerful, but to protect the person who is being oppressed. That is the three stories of Moshe. But if you look carefully, we have another 60 seconds. So we'll show that these, this theme itself, the theme that repeats itself, standing up for the oppressed, actually progresses. In other words, the first story is the easiest. The third story is the hardest. So what's the first story? Now it came to pass in those days that Moses grew up and went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his brothers. Okay, this is actually Moshe's Moshe's. He turned this way and that way, and he saw that there was no man, nobody else looking. So he struck the Egyptian and hit him in the sand, killed him, buried him in the, in the sand, hid the evidence. The bottom line is, relatively speaking, psychologically speaking, this is easiest. Why is it easiest? Because Moshe, wh- why this happened, I don't know. But it's clear that Moshe identifies himself because Moshe is a mixed, mixed, is a hybrid. He's Hebrew, but he's raised in the, in the Pharaoh's home. But it's clear that Moshe at this point identifies himself as a Hebrew because the verse says, striking a Hebrew man of his brothers. So Moshe identifies as a Hebrew. So it's much easier to stand up to someone in the, uh, in the outside group attacking a member of your own group. Right? That's, that's we're, we're primed to do that. We're primed to worry about our, to, 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 to uh, protect our herd. And, and to, when it's us versus them, it's very easy to rile to protect yourself, to protect your group. That's easy gets a little harder in the second story. The second story, he went out on the second day and behold, two Hebrew men were quarreling. Ah, two Jews fighting? Wh- wh- why should I get involved, right? It's much harder to get involved when they, within your group, there are two people fighting where it's not, you don't have the attitude of the threat from the outside person from the outside group at which, which, which would rile you to protect your own group. That's harder. Nevertheless, Moshe steps in and he says to the wicked one, why are you going to strike your friend? And the guy basically says, oh, every, um, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Moshe's like, I got to get out of here because everybody hears, heard about this. Pharaoh hears, hears. Pharaoh wants to, wants, to, wants to kill Moshe. Moshe runs away to Midian, comes to the, comes to the well. Now at the well, what happens at the well? But the shepherd, now the chief of Midian had seven daughters and they came and drew water and they filled the, the, thro- the throws to, to water their father's flocks. But the shepherds came and drove them away. So Moses arose and rescued and watered their flocks. Okay, here it's even harder because you are a stranger. You're coming to a strange land. Why are you getting involved in someone else's society? It's not your group. Right, so it's two members. So it's people from a different society. You're a stranger. You have no business here. One person is oppressing the other. Why are you getting involved? And nevertheless, that's the hardest place to get involved. And that's what Moshe does. And right after that, we read about Moshe as a shepherd. And then God speaks to him. This is the man. These are the credentials. This is what we're looking for in a leader. So again, the three steps. It's easier to protect some, a member of your own group against oppression from the outsider. It's harder when you have two people of your own group fighting. Easier to ignore. And it's even easier to ignore when you have two people from a different society and you're a stranger and you're not part of the society and yet he steps in and he saves them. These are Moses' credentials. These, this is why he gets the job. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this has been fun. Comments, questions, please share. Otherwise have a wonderful day and I hope everybody feels 
Good, and has a good day. Mechaya, cheers. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Thank day. Thank you. Wonderful day, everybody.